about learning this really is Carolyn Bryant. And she never talked about the Till case on there, but she did talk about her own feelings about a variety of things, family, all that kind of stuff. So I, I, I kind of Facebook stalked her for about a year. Um, and so at some point she went private on her page, but I was still able to find things she said. I just went to her friends' pages, and if she responded to stuff on there, I still was able to get her. Uh, and I, everything she said, I, I did a screenshot of it. So, so here I am, never being able to interview Carolyn Bryant, but I'm getting all the stuff from her on a daily basis. It was like, this is great. I'm just going on Facebook and getting all kinds of stuff. Now I know about her background, her family, what she's been up to, what she likes to do, this and that. And it's interesting, she's, um, you forget that someone that was involved, and I don't know her involvement other than being married to one of the killers and being forced to whatever role she had, I don't know that it was, I, I've never gotten the impression she was a willing participant. But you see her smiling and kissing Roy after the acquittal, makes you kind of mad that she was um, so happy that her husband got away with murder. But to learn about her, it was interesting, she has a daughter that was born deaf, and so Carolyn had to learn sign language, and very, very good at it. And once when Carolyn was driving uh, in town somewhere, maybe it was Greenville, she came upon a car accident, and the woman in the car that got in the accident was deaf. So Carolyn had to, uh, Carolyn got out of her car, ran over there and assisted her with sign language until the police arrived. Now if you've studied this case and you know about the Bryans and the Milans and these people and you're angry at them and you kind of hate them and all that, suddenly you're thrown for a loop that, wow, this person, whoever she was, this kind of humanized her a little bit for me. And I wanted readers to see that side because no matter who you are, you're not a one-dimensional person. Uh, yes, the bad in you will overshadow the good sometimes and you have to pay a price for that and go to prison forever. But not, nobody's a one-dimensional person, and I had to learn that by humanizing Carolyn somewhat. And so I learned these things about her, and it was interesting too, and this I got from Facebook and my research. I kind of did, as I was doing research, I saw that during the time of the Emmett Till murder, there were two, they had two children, uh, and those two boys uh, of Roy and Carolyn Bryant attended the trial for a couple of days, and the press made a big deal out of it, especially the white press, because these two boys were on... Myler and Bryant's knee, and they thought, how could a killer if it have maybe bouncing children off their, their knees? Just impossible. So that was, the, that was what people wanted to see by having these kids in court. But their son, Frankie, was born after the trial, and he, uh, uh, the, on his birthday, after he had died, Carolyn said on Facebook, and I can't remember the day or the year, but she said, Today would have been Frankie's such and such birthday, I sure miss him. And I thought, that day sounds a little familiar to me. And so I uh, looked and I thought, yeah, a newspaper article has Roy, this is about a year after the trial, Roy and Carolyn were driving one night and they got in a head-on collision with a military man at a local Air Force base. And they all had to go to the hospital. And I thought, okay, Carolyn gets in a head-on car collision this night, her son is born that same day. Did this, uh, prank, did this accident uh, send her into labor and that. So between Facebook, between research, I was able to find out a lot of stuff about these people and their families and that. And everybody who was a source for me, for Carolyn Bryant, for Roy, one of the black men who was on the back of the truck, his name was Levi Two Tight Collins. If you know anything about the case or read the book, you may remember him. Uh, all these people would talk to me most of them having talked for the first time ever. They never talked to anybody else. But they wouldn't let me put their names in the book. So if you look at the book, you'll see that there are, I think, four confidential sources. Confidential source A, B, C, and D. So these are family members talking for the first time. So if you read chapter 10 of the book, that's the chapter where I dedicated to finding out what happened to all these people after the trial. And I spent a lot of time, Mamie Till Mobley was easy to research because she was a public figure. But Emma's uncle, who we stayed with and who pointed the men out in court, I learned about him, I learned about Roy and Carolyn. Roy Bryant, it was interesting, he had several bouts with uh, law in the, in the mid-1980s. Uh, he ran another store, this time in Ruleville, and uh, he was convicted of food stamp fraud twice and uh, had to serve some time in 
prison. He didn't serve the first time. They didn't. He didn't have to serve any time. But when he did it again a few years later, he had to serve time. He just didn't serve his whole sentence. Uh, his attorney arguing that he a, was a good citizen. They couldn't bring up the Emmett Till case really because he was acquitted of that. And so I guess that didn't wouldn't have really made play into it. I don't know if legally they could have or mentioned it or what, but uh, they really couldn't. And so. Uh, so he was convicted of food stamp fraud a couple of times. The second time, his sister was convicted with him. And J.W. Milan was arrested for food for uh, credit card fraud and writing bad checks and for assault and things like that. So he went to jail uh, too, just briefly. And so we see what happened to these people. One of the things that Mamie Till Mobley told me was, I asked her in my re during my research in one of our interviews, I said, what is it like for you to know these men got away with this. Do you think about them? Do you, does it anger you or any of that? And she said, you know something? Mercifully, and she's a very religious woman, so she said, and her words were, mercifully, the Lord just took them out of my heart and out of my mind. I don't feel love, I don't feel hate. I don't feel anything. And she said, had she have hated them, she would have been consumed by it. Uh, and so she allowed, she didn't want them to win by her hating them, so she was able to just put them out of her mind, and she went on to live a very good life. She became a school teacher, but what she also did was um, uh, start a group called the Emmett Till Players. Emma was her only child, but she, and she said by nature she was a homebody, that like her mother, she would have just stayed home and, and just you know been happy to, to raise her child and, and stay home and that. But after Emma's death, she became a school teacher. She started a group called the Emma Till Players, which she um, ran for years. And she took at-risk kids, and they would perform. They would memorize speeches of Dr. Martin Luther King. They would perform all over the country. She said she, these kids were kids that she still knew in her later years, and many of them became doctors, lawyers, ministers. So in her mind, she had saved. She had lost one child, but saved so many more. And she was determined that Emmett not die in vain for that very reason. And because it would have been hard for her just to die and, and the world not gain anything from it. So she saved hundreds of kids over the course of her life, helped them live a much better life. And so that's what she gained out of it. Milam and Bryant, even though they never spent a day in prison after the trial, uh, for this anyway, they, uh, they struggled to make a living. Uh, Milam was in poverty most of the time. His wife had to run a hair salon just to be able to, for them to have any money because he didn't hold a job. Roy Bryant became a welder, but in the process of him welding all the time, he became, it damaged his eyesight and he died legally blind. They both died of cancer. And a relative of J. W. Milam told me that he suffered, he was in tremendous pain for a long time as a result of his cancer. And um, so neither one of them had, even though they didn't spend a day in prison, they lived in prisons of their own making, really. A prison doesn't have to have walls, uh, literal walls, but if you put yourself in a prison because you're ostracized and you can't go out and do anything because of something bad you did has, has limited your ability to make a living and do this and do that, you're basically living in a prison. So these are prisons without walls. And so I learned that in learning about Milan McBride. So as, as my research, and I, and I put this in the chapter to show people what happened to them because people really wanted to know what really happened to these guys in the long run. And what were their lives, did they, even though they got paid money for telling their story and they profited that way, the rest of their life um, they were able to live and regret it. They regretted it in one sense, but they didn't regret it in the sense that they really had remorse. They, they regretted it in the sense that uh, because of this, their lives were miserable. In the beginning of my book, I have a couple of quotes from Roy Bryant, and it's kind of why I came up. My original title for this book was The Boy Who Never Died, The Saga of the Emmett Till Murder, because Emmett Till had never really died, and, and there were reasons for that. Um, here's what Roy Bryant had to say uh, in the 80s. to newspaper reporters. He said, when a newspaper reporter tried to interview him in 1985, he said, he's been dead 30 years, and I can't see why he can't stay dead. Then he told another reporter in 1992, Emmett Till is dead and gone. Why can't people leave the dead alone and quit trying to stir things up? 
So he was perplexed that people wouldn't let Emmett Till